app, Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN. More now from the Muslim Public Affairs Council. It recently held a discussion on political extremism in Muslim societies. This is just under 90 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, we have another special guest, the former chief of police for Los Angeles P Police Department. He's now currently a councilman for uh, one of the major districts in the city of Los Angeles. He's also a candidate for mayor, and he is one of the very pioneering individuals who began the partnership between law enforcement and the American Muslim community. Please welcome Councilman Bernard Parks. Good afternoon. What timing. I walked in the door and I heard my name. I appreciate the opportunity to come out and talk with you. Uh, I am so pleased to be here and certainly uh, we hope that you feel the comfort that we hope that we're extending uh, during the period of uh, my term as chief of police that we found uh, in this city with so many languages, so many cultures, that there's absolutely no way that anyone can live in isolation, that no one could live by exclusion. But the one thing we found well in advance of September 11th is that there is so much ignorance and lack of understanding of people who live in and around our neighborhoods, in our community. And in so many times, people are willing to stereotype the unknown as being fear, and they're so willing to stereotype what they do not feel comfortable with as being bad. And because someone may look different, speak different, uh, or have a different culture, that there is a sense of moving at arm's distance because they really can't be, quote, trusted. But having been in the city of LA for most of my life, we've seen in many instances, almost every ethnic group go through that transition. When I grew up on 33rd and Central, blacks in the city of LA did not live west of Main Street. Uh, when we saw the inclusion of Hispanic growth, they were relegated to the east side of the city of Los Angeles. These are the transitions that we go through uh, as it relates to as communities and we, even within the police department. I re when I came on the police department in 1965, there are barely enough officers to have a meeting in a, in a phone booth. But we found that as time went on and growth and we saw black officers, Hispanic officers, in fact, I tell people that many of you that are students of civil rights, many of us think that all the civil rights gains were in the South because they were so visible on television. But when we really realized, and I give you a, a, a statement that basically cause catches people by surprise. It wasn't until 1961, and you can think about where you were in 1961, that the LAPD allowed black and white officers to ride in the same police car. 1961. I can remember like yesterday sitting on the corner of Western and Adams and saw for the first time in my life a black and a white police officer in the same police car. And it was so remarkable that I went home and told my parents about it. That shows us that we have had gains here, but certainly civil rights wasn't just in the South. And we still find that in, in the same period of time, we had covenants in the Lamert Park area that said, they didn't call them blacks then, Negroes, Orientals, and Jews could not live in Lamert Park, Crenshaw area for any 24-hour consecutive period. There was covenants in the title of the property. And so these are things that we've seen the transition of our city and of our region. And one thing that I feel comfortable about is the fact that there are no more majorities. Every group is a minority 
which then tells us that all of us have to find a work, a way to coalesce, understand, work with each other if we're going to be successful at anything. Because no one group can carry the day in the city of Los Angeles. No one language, no one group, no one ethnic background. Everybody has to learn the one mission of inclusion, coalitions, and understanding. Well, that gives us a good stepping stone for why we're here today to talk about what your communities and your religion has been impacted because we had some horrible incidents in this city and throughout the nation on September 11th. But we kind of forget that the Oklahoma City bombing, what was the first information that came out? The terrorists were who? Muslims and apparently Middle Easterners found out the only Middle East was East Oklahoma <laughs> as it relates to those militants that were in, the, in, the, in, in this country. But that was the first information, and it went like wildfire because people, it fed into the biases and the stereotypes of people wanting to believe that. Same thing in Los Angeles at the September 11th. People that were non-Muslims and Muslims were being attacked because people said, they, they, they kind of look the same, so it's got to be the same people. People that were Christians that just happened to wear a headdress were being attacked in their businesses because of the ignorance of those on the streets. So I would just say to all of you that our mission, although there has been considerable progress made, our mission for the future is to build on what has been achieved in the past so that we can see in the future that these subjects will become less and less significant because it's the way things occur rather than us having to create programs and new agendas to get people to talk to each other. And that's where I think that the Public Affairs Council and bringing together people that are talking about this whole issue of extremism. The only extremism we should have in our lives in our country is honesty and integrity. Everything else, we have to use some discretion to understand what it really means to get along with people and understand their cultures. And the minute we start talking about zero tolerance, and we hear that term a lot, the minute we hear the term zero tolerance, it tells people don't think anymore. Don't think anymore. And when you don't think, you then have a right to abuse people. And that's why it's important that we continue to look for ways to educate and understand. And we think back no more than 20 years ago how people thought you caught AIDS by touching a doorknob and how we progress today to understand that not only was untrue, it was biased beyond imagination that people thought you could pass someone in the hallway and catch AIDS. We found that minorities and when I was growing up that blacks didn't have a tail and they didn't smell funny and they didn't smell differently. These are all those stereotypes that people work through. And yes, if you wear a headdress, it doesn't have a gun in it. It doesn't have something that's negative. And no, you don't belong to some subversive group. To give you an idea, when I joined the police department in 65, if you wore a natural, everybody knows what a natural is, you were considered on the left wing of what we were doing. Just a mere wearing of a natural. And if you wore a natural and a leather jacket, you were a Black Panther immediately. And so. What we found during those early days in the police department, that there were probably more black officers in the intelligence file than people that were subversives, because people thought they were out doing things that they shouldn't do. So education is a big part of what we're here today. And I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here to speak with you and encourage you. Don't give up. For every step you make forward, somewhere in this country, somewhere in this city, somebody's going to take a half a step back backwards. And you're going to look at the TV and look at something and say, I thought it was 2004 and we're still de dealing with this. As long as they're human beings, we're going to be dealing with bias. We're going to be dealing with people that don't understand. And at minimum, insensitivity. At maximum, racism and just intolerance. So we can't give up. It's our mission to educate. And certainly, we're not going to win everyone over. But what's important for us is never stop fighting the good fight in the battle. And one thing I want to just let you know, as it relates to, uh, it's okay to applaud.
One thing I want you to know, as I continue to move on this path of running for mayor of the city of Los Angeles, I'm going to make a couple of commitments to you. That you're going to find an administration that's inclusive, not just for political purposes, but for the purpose of getting the best minds and understanding. And in my judgment, diversity just doesn't mean we have a chart and we get so many blacks and so many Hispanics and so many yellows and so many greens and we get an array of colors. Diversity, in my mind, is a difference in thought. In my judgment, had we had people in this administration today that had different thoughts and said, wait a minute, stop, we wouldn't have the corruption on our front pages today. But when everybody thinks alike, when everybody's willing to give in as it relates to issues because it's the way things are moving, that's how you get people going down the slippery slope of discrimination, of looking at issues the same way without that diverse view. And just as I did in the police department, willing to pull together forums throughout the city that talked about issues of race, talked about issues of religion, talked about issues of sexual orientation, meeting with them routinely to understand citywide what their issues were so that we could make proper solutions. Not answers to their questions, but solutions to their problem. So that's my commitment to make sure you're aware that we're not looking just for people to vote. We're looking for people to help run an administration of the city that they pay taxes into and they should be a part of, and that we should not be discriminatory because you believe in a certain religion or you come from a different culture or you may dress differently than the rest. That is beyond what we should be doing. And some great man once said that we should judge people on the content of their character and not the color of their skin. And I'm sure you know who that great man was. Thank you very much. I appreciate being here. That's quite a conspiracy. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, and we are grateful to God to bring us together for good causes. Uh, this panel will, as you will notice, is, is different from different aspects. Uh, and, and number one, we have ha very high caliber uh, women and men uh, on, on, on this panel uh, to the point that moderating the panel became a problem. And they decided, in the wisdom of the organizing committee, that I should moderate so that they guarantee that I will not speak much. <laughs> Number two, I am older, so there might be some edge for the age. Number three, I'm bigger, <laughs> and so I can enforce the rules as much as I can, which I am planning to do, inshallah. And uh, I am not a nice moderator like uh, the previous ones who very discreetly pass a card saying five minutes, it will be very noticeable. Hey, 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 you exceeded the time. Something of, of, of that sort. Uh, so, but I am counting on the cooperation of the, of the great people. I am, I am really humbled uh, to be with them uh, on, on the same forum. Uh, this also is a panel where we told the, the members don't prepare. As a matter of fact, Hussein Abish was panicking. He said, what is this? He saw papers. You told me don't pr prepare, uh, which is true. We, we, it's not uh, a premeditated, prepared thing because we, we have an, a, a discussion of important issues. And when you are talking about something very important, better don't prepare so that you can you can really uh, bring the guts out and 
and speak your mind. Uh, we started 15 minutes late, and the councilman gracefully gave us five minutes. Guess how am I going to compensate for this time? I will not go through their bios. Because if I go through the bios of such uh, people, that will be the rest of the day. And I am sure, although uh, they are very accomplished people, but you can go to your uh, books and you will find all the details in the bios. However, I, in representing them, I selected one thing about each person that with their, my very subjective, fallible estimate is uh, the, the very important thing for, for our panel today. Uh, without wasting uh, any uh, further time, I, what I will say about uh, Professor Dr. John Esposito uh, is that, number one, if you read the list of his publications, you will not have time to read his books. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 enough to say that he is one of the pioneers, and I'm not exaggerating, of uh, building bridges on intelligent basis between people of different religions. He focused first on Muslim-Christian relations, but he expanded. Uh, John is, is probably one of the very few great spokespersons for Islam and the Muslims. Uh, sometimes I even thought that he is striving to the title Sheikh John Ospisito, uh, but he probably will get more benefit of him being John Ospisito. Uh, Hussein Ebesh is a correspondent for the Beirut-based Daily Star newspaper, but uh, really, and also he, he works now with the embryonic uh, Progressive Muslim Union uh, that we hope that it grows and strives in the uh, good direction. And uh, he is a uh, director for American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, was, and uh, but if you wanted to know about uh, Hussein Ebish, it is about his wit and the uh, plethora of information that he shows on TV and on radio shows. Uh, he really shines, and um, I guess he gets a high when he uh, debates Daniel Pipes. Yeah. So, uh, Serene <laughs> uh, Sinar. Uh, is uh, a uh, 2004 Equal Justice Works Fellow. Uh, she is an attorney, a Committee for Civil Rights, and she really has uh, a career and a record to make her very proud, but to make us very proud of her for standing tall in certain cases that were deemed as unpopular. Uh, uh, not very much uh, appealing or attractive to, to young lawyers, uh, young in age only, and appearance, uh, uh, to take. But she, she was courageous enough always uh, to stand on the side of justice, and for that we're really very grateful to her. Uh, Jack Miles is, is a very intriguing thinker and author, uh, extremely, extremely eloquent, and uh, can uh, thought-provoking, uh, and uh, uh, has a way of uh, pushing you really to the edge to force you to think. Uh, sometimes in a very provocative titles, but once you, you, uh, you read the title and you say, I want to find this man to fight with him, then you read the book and you say, I love this man, I agree with everything he said. Uh, he, he wrote uh, God, a biography. He wrote Christ, a crisis in the life of God. Uh, he was a Jesuit seminarian. Uh, he worked in, uh, he taught at the University of Rome, 
and at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He is a great voice for integrity and for peace and for justice. This is the panel I am supposed to deal with today, so help me God. Uh, uh, the topic we are talking about is political extremism. The, the previous panel was about religious extremism. And uh, I have to admit that sometimes the lines between both are blurred. Uh, and we, we will see how our panelists will, uh, will say about this. So we, we, the reason that we brought these titles is that we believe that what is hurting America now and what can hurt America in the future, and what can cause immense suffering in the world, and what can hinder the full participation of the American Muslims in the uh, debate and in shaping the decisions are uh, two powers, the power of political extremism and the power of religious extremism. So we decided both to be the theme of our panel, of our uh, convention. And uh, today, uh, at this time, we are focusing on uh, uh, political extremism. And I will uh, start the discussion. And uh, uh, it is uh, uh, free for, for the panel. Then later on, you write your questions on the cards so that we brought in the circle of uh, of, of the discussion and of the debate at the end of the session. Uh, I'll uh, initiate things by throwing certain questions, and then uh, that will lead us uh, to sail in the, in the ocean of exploration of, uh, of ideas that uh, will be very enriching to us. And I will begin the first uh, question is, uh, that was brought up in the morning, really, that we talk about things without definition. Shouldn't we define the issues? Uh, not necessarily to agree on a definition, but at least to try to speak the same language. And uh, I'll, I'll probably venture, and I really will enjoy my authority here today. I'll pick and choose and, and things like that. I'll ask Jack Miles, uh, to give us a definition of political extremism. Oh, your time is over. No. <laughs> that, that is extreme. No. <laughs> political uh, extremism is uh, the exclusion of all political views uh, uh, but one and uh, the enforcement of that exclusion by police power. Yeah, that, uh, uh, do you agree with that? Or do you want to add to it? Or, or a bottle of anyone? You first, Is this on? Or? Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Well, the first thing I would say, be, uh, I'm glad that Jack defined it that way, because I was trying to think of how I could say what I'm going to say now without seeming to be off the wall. By that definition, then we know that uh, it's very clear that a significant number of Muslim governments themselves are extremists, uh, many of them allies of the United States. And part of the problem I think we have, <laughs> part of the problem I think we have uh, in the US uh, among people who don't know the realities of the region is that uh, the word extremist, we have the same problem in a way with the word terrorism because we never apply it to states. We say that you can't apply it in terms of the definition. And for many, when they even want to define political extremism, they don't apply it to states, unless it's a state that we don't like. You know, so then it might be that we'd say that about the Taliban or Iran, but by and large, we don't use that phrase. But I think that if one wants to get, get even at the reality of how extremism develops in the, in the Arab and Muslim world, um, instead of starting with movements, you should look at the government, and then, then you can move to the movements as they de develop in relationship to the government. Uh, I, I think I see this a little differently uh, because the definition that Jack provided really does, uh, it, it's limited in, in precisely the opposite way, in, in which uh, the way he framed it, uh, 
police authority, in other words, the power of the state, uh, is necessary for the expression of political extremism, and, and I don't think that's true. Uh, I think that um, extremism is, is almost a, a state of mind, uh, and it, it can be reflected through state power and through state authority, <clears throat> but I think it can also be reflected um, through other sorts of, um, uh, of practices uh, by all kinds of non-state actors. And so I'd like to say what I think are the, um, the two principal characteristics of extremism, political extremism, and, and really other forms of it, even religious extremism, is, is, is very similar. Um, the first is not just uh, you know, a, a sense of, uh, of uh, excluding of other points of view, which I, I agree with, but it's more than that. Um, I, I think that political extremism is expressed through um, mechanisms, including just discursive mechanisms, including just rhetorical devices, uh, as well as uh, f other forms of coercion, including state power, that serve to limit the range of choices available to other people. That, that is the first characteristic. Um, I think uh, it's a characteristic that all extremist uh, political uh, actors have shared um, all, throughout human history. The second um, characteristic that I identify with political and other forms of extremism is irresponsibility. I, I think uh, political extremists are almost always so devoted to their ideas that they behave ultimately in an irresponsible way because they have a disregard for the consequences of their actions that, uh, that are informed by their um, extreme devotion to their extreme ideas and because they think uh, out of context. Art Torres gave a very good example of this when he referred to zero tolerance policies and zero tolerance legislation shutting down the thought process and shutting down the debate. And I think that that, that sort of um, extremist policy or that kind of extreme version of the law where no um, allowance for context or mitigation is permitted uh, and indeed the, the process of judgment is foreclosed by a, a prejudgment of zero tolerance is a very good example of the irresponsibility and disregard for uh, consequences and context that I think you find uh, in political extremists. Uh, one final uh, observation. Um, if you look at our own government, the, the present Bush administration, I think you can see um, tendencies and actors that are plainly uh, extremists, in, in, in fact, uh, in some cases, a very rarefied and dangerous form of political extremism. I think you can identify other tendencies and actors that, are, uh, in, that don't, I think, qualify under my definition. So even within a state, and even within a particular administration of a state, say the first four years of the Bush uh, administration we've just seen, uh, you know, there's, there's extremist tendencies and, and non-extremist tendencies, and uh, they, uh, they don't sit very well together, I think. Okay. Uh, yes, please, I was going to ask you to, please. Uh, I would add that I think one other important component of the definition uh, is that extremism of all forms is particularly dangerous to human rights. And I think that individual rights always suffer um, under any uh, you know, intolerance. Um, I would agree with Hussein that uh, intellectual intolerance itself can be extremism, but um, going off this example of the, the last four years, I think we would also all agree that um, an intellectual ideology of extremism united with power and the opportunity to, uh, to actualize that is the most dangerous thing. And just one quick example, um, I think that uh, you know, you have a number of people in this country who are neoconservatives or um, who have very right-wing uh, views on civil rights. But increasingly in the last four years, and now what we see increasingly from this point onward, these people um, have judicial appointments. Um, you know, they're in the court system. They're in, in the White House. And I think that's where the danger of extremism comes from, the ideology united with power. Can I just add one quick thing? The, the, the thing is that the extremist tendencies that you're referring to in the Bush administration that have expressed themselves, especially in the past three years, but over the past four years, uh, don't exist in a vacuum. They are an expression of a, of a much larger extremist movement that had, has its roots in, the cons in elements of the conservative movement that's been growing since the early 60s, that, that has a, you know, a strong presence in the media, in think tanks, and ultimately gets its funding from uh, very wealthy individual and corporate funders. So there is, it's not, 
it's not just the state. It's all kinds of other sources of power that are non-state, that express themselves um, in different ways, including through the power of this administration and the extremism that it, uh, that it represents. So I think you, it, it's, it's important to recognize um, the, the diverse ways in which um, political extremism can mobilize itself. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, we can uh, forge a, a definition that we use, at least for, for today, using everything that we heard, and uh, basically it is the exclusion of other from the debate or the decision making, which becomes more dangerous when the ideas are supported by an authority that can actualize that exclusion and, uh, and make uh, dissent uh, almost uh, impossible. I just uh, wanted to add the power of demagoguery as, as uh, one of the intimidating uh, factors that are used widely. Uh, probably uh, John alluded to the situation in the Muslim countries, and I think the, the demagogic power is, 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 is horrendous in, uh, in suppressing uh, uh, certain opinions. So I, I, at least now when we talk about extremism, we all know uh, what we mean. They try to preempt the second question is uh, the manifestations. And now we are talking, we are moving from the, the citadels of academia to the street level to where me and you live and, and deal. The manifestations of this in the United States, uh, in our country now, uh, how is it manifesting itself uh, so that we can, we can find our way around, and I will uh, ask uh, Dr. Sinar to start this time, uh, being the lawyer of civil rights and... Thank you for the doctorate a... as well, which uh, I do not... uh, I'm very generous with these things. I... <laughs> <laughs> He's also going to give you a Mercedes at the end yeah, of the year. Yeah. <laughs> as long as I'm not paying for it here. <laughs> Uh, thank I mean, you. if I give uh, John the sheikh, I give you the doctor, that's... <laughs> what do I get? Oh, you'll get lots of good things. <laughs> um, I, th I think many of us are aware of a lot of the uh, threats and dangers to civil liberties that we've seen in the last few years. Um, I think one manifestation, uh, or I'll mention actually a couple of manifestation of uh, political extremism in the form of uh, additional dangers to civil rights that I think we'll be facing from here on outward. And I mention these specifically because I don't think that they're as much on the radar screen uh, of the Muslim community. And uh, one is the threat from Congress um, of enacting very strong anti-immigration and anti-civil rights legislation in the coming term. Uh, and we barely avoided that this past fall um, with the 9-11 Commission recommendations bill that uh, at one point had many very harsh anti-immigration provisions and uh, some of those were removed, some made it through. And we're going to see much more of this coming up in the next term. Um, so that's just one example that I think we should all be aware of. Uh, one more, more point, and I, I flagged this in my uh, last response, but um, I'm very concerned about uh, the issue of judicial appointments. And I mention this because I think that for most of us, we don't um, think of the courts as having as much of a role in policy as, say, the administration. But particularly with uh, openings on the Supreme Court um, that may be happening next week or next month, but certainly very soon, um, we really see a danger of uh, the judiciary going even more to the right. And that has a very, very significant effect uh, on our civil rights. Um, and this is happening throughout the court system. I worked last year for the Ninth Circuit, which has a reputation for being a liberal circuit. And uh, you know, I tell people all the time, if you only knew what the newer judges on the court are like and how the court is moving in a rightward direction, there are numerous people on the court who are hostile to civil rights. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Jack Pence, if you want to. I'd like to uh, ex uh, expand just a bit on the, the definition of, uh, of extremism before commenting on the, the manifestations of it. Sitting alone in your room, uh, you may be moderate uh, or extreme. We speak of extremism in connection uh, with, with uh, balance, uh, don't we? Uh, 
there's the expression, you may have heard it, more Catholic than the Pope. I think most, uh, most religions have some such expression. Uh, we, we wish our, our uh, co-religionists to be devout, to be loyal to the tradition, to be learned in it, but we recognize that there is such a thing as excess. And uh, excess in almost any good thing can turn that good thing into a bad thing. Uh, what is it uh, that, um, that provokes um, extremism? I think it can be certainly provoked by, among other things, uh, suspicion and the, the perception that one is uh, regarded with hostility. When uh, that assumption, which is I, I note is uh, in this excellent uh, document that, uh, that has been prepared, I regard this as a, a superb example of stealing the weapon from the enemy. The enemy uh, understands himself to be fighting uh, you and defines you as a terrorist, then join the fight against terrorism, and the enemy is left clawing the air, we might say. This, uh, this presumption of, of suspicion then, I think, uh, provokes a, an exaggeration of identification with, uh, with the group that is thought to be most protective, and an exaggeration of whatever seems most distinctive uh, about that group. And in this way, there can, there can be generated a slide toward behaviors that would never have occurred were the group left uh, to itself to pursue uh, what it would find in its own uh, best interest. Doing that, pursuing its, uh, its private path, it would, uh, it would seek balance. Uh, one exaggeration would, uh, would be corrected by another and the uh, point, the midpoint would be, uh, would be achieved without great difficulty. Uh, it is the intrusion from the outside by hostile uh, and suspicious forces that, uh, that provokes this. This is uh, why uh, demagogic statements of the sort that I, I needn't rehearse for you here uh, do the, the internal harm uh, that they do. That said, uh, I would certainly join uh, Shireen in saying that there is no more basic protection of civil rights in our country than, uh, than habeas corpus. If you're charged with a crime, you must be told what, what the crime is that you are charged with, and if none can be specified, you must be released. This is what is now uh, being um, eroded so, uh, so shockingly that people can be held, it seems, without charge. That is deeply disturbing and, and disturbing to all of us. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you, you probably, probably some of you know that the, lately, in the last three or four days, there was about four or five articles published uh, attacking Isla, uh, attacking MPAC uh, severely. Uh, but the, the attack is very interesting. They say it is a slick, sneaky organization that wants to pretend to be American and that they are so good at it that even Salam al-Marayati speaks without an accent. <laughs> so, uh, 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 and, uh, and that confirmed the wisdom why I let Salam speak, not me, because uh, it, it, the, 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 the racism went that far that when a, the guy is born here, uh, speaks without an accent, it becomes a trick he's playing to, to, to fool the American people into believing that Muslims are Americans and wow, wh what are we going to be fighting then? The, the, the very point that uh, uh, Jack Miles alluded to, which is, is quite interesting, and it, it also touches on the issue of demagoguery that we were talking about. Uh, I, I wonder whether, uh, shall I jump to the next question or, uh, or uh, John, you want to say, please? Um, I just want to uh, mention to some of you that you may want to uh, try to take a look at Bill Moyer's uh, program last night. Um, Moyer's dealt, and this was his last uh, program, um, he's leaving uh, the program now to, just to do documentaries, uh, but he actually dealt with the media, particularly the rise of the conservative media. And he spoke with Richard Vigore, who talked about the rise of the conservatives from the 60s when they were invisible to today. But in the course of it, it dealt with the way in which conservative media 
uh, from Rush Limbaugh to O'Reilly and others, have dealt not only with Kerry, but the Anita Hill situation years ago. And what emerges, and in fact, there's a new book by a con somebody who for 12 years was a, a leading conservative, young leading conservative uh, media person and wrote a couple of books. Uh, in which he basically, the, th this new book that's been written, demonstrates that for many, there's a change in ethic that occurred. And this is where you get an extremism. That is, it, it, it came to believe, and this is what I see a good deal of it today, that the, uh, the end justifies the means. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, you can write a book on Anita Hill or you can write a book about John Kerry, and it can be exaggerated, it can be distorted, it can be... But, but really, what you're really doing is you're saying, this is a bad person, I know the person's bad, and so then by any means I take them down, even if there's fabrication. And we see, and, and then it also talked about the extent to which today some 80 or 90% of the talk shows are dominated by these kinds of voices. Well, I think that it's fair to say, if we talk about extremists, that we are talking uh, in terms of major influence today, certainly uh, in terms of print and electronic media, the political commentators. The O'Reillys of the world, the Ann Coulters, the Daniel Pipes, not a scholar, but an extremist ideologue, uh, and, and many others. And I think that that's, that's very, very important. It's also interesting that those who, for example, would talk about MPAC and Salam, although I'd want to ask Layla whether or not Salam really does speak with an accent <laughs> um, when he's not speaking in public. Um, but um, it's interesting that the very description you read about MPAC and Salam if one said that about APAC, yeah. can you imagine what would be said? In fact, most editors wouldn't even put it out there. Yes. And, and the final example of the extremism is if you take some articles that have been published, or even the recent uh, stuff with regard to Tariq Ramadan, there are statements made by a variety of commentators, both in France and the United States, about Tariq Ramadan, in which they feel no need to give any evidence. Right. And editors publish them. On the other hand, if you were to say that about a Jew or a Christian, an editor would bounce the article back and say, you either have to give me supportive evidence or I can't publish this or put that out there. So that level of extremism, I think, is particularly dangerous because that's what most Americans hear and read. That's where they get their news. I mean, for many, they get it from television. So Fox News can, in fact, be a vehicle of extremism. Yeah. I wanted to. Hussein? Yeah, I, I, I really wanted to raise, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because I wanted to raise the example uh, of uh, Tariq Ramadan. It, it's, a, it's, it's, the, it's the most extreme case, I think, of the, uh, this pattern that we've seen whereby MPAC was accused of false moderation yeah. or uh, something like that. Or, uh, you know, I've been accused of everything. I, I love when they called me a Wahhabi Marxist. This is a... <laughs> a, a, a oh, you're also known as a, you know, as a unicorn or something. I mean, completely implausible creature of myth. Uh, but, uh, but, what, but some people were very specific about the kind of, of, uh, of dissimulation they were accusing Tariq Ramadan of performing. They accused him specifically of practicing a kind of taqiyya, right? That's, that, was, that word was precisely labeled against Tariq Ramadan, all right? And that is the, essentially the, the uh, idea, whether, whether people are, are clever enough like Fouad Ajami or others to actually pick up that word and use that specific accusation, or whether they just will make generalized comments about Muslims feeling uh, somehow religiously authorized to dissimulate, to, to, to dissemble about their uh, about their religious views um, and, and that somehow there's some kind of plenary uh, dispensation to do that uh, built into the religion or into some readings of the religion. This is the basic accusation uh, against all of us from every part of the spectrum. And what that does is to absolutely foreclose any self-consciously American Muslim voice or Western Muslim voice. If everyone, no matter what you say, can be accused in, in essence of practicing some form or another of taqiyya, then the debate is absolutely foreclosed. And in the case of Tariq Ramadan, uh, you know, it, it is the most remarkable thing because you know, his, his book is really an extra, in the last one, Western Muslims and the Future of Islam, really sort of presents a, a template for how to think very differently about being a Muslim in the West from, uh, from a 
you know, really a traditional frame of reference, a frame of reference that's very different than, than mine, for example. Uh, if this is, uh, you know, a, an exercise of taqiyya, it's one that's entirely counterproductive to its own aims. In other words, it can't possibly be true, right? It just, it just cannot be true because the effect, I mean, who would know? Right, that, that Tariq Ramadan is secretly, uh, you know, an extremist. Uh, the effect of his book is going to be, and his writings is going to be widespread, it's going to be long-lasting, it's going to be irreversible. Right? Whatever he supposedly does in, you know, in, in, the, in the kitchen with the door locked or whatever is, is of no influence at all. But what happens is the debate is foreclosed. And I think that it, it is one of the most insidious forms of demagoguery around. Yeah, this is... Uh... Uh, this is very true. One of the, probably I consider it the most interesting, uh, uh, amazing remarks that were said about, uh, about Tariq Ramadan, who, who will have him via satellite uh, this evening, uh, God willing, is that he is guilty by lineage. Yeah. Honestly, it was said, it was written. Yeah. He is guilty by lineage. His ancestors are, 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 are extremists, uh, which is the most, uh, I mean, in modern time. Uh, yeah, of course, his brother and his mother and his grandfather and his father, the lineage, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, God knows if I look at the lineage of people sitting here, probably some of you are the descendants of Al Capone. I, uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, but, uh, but this is really uh, uh, another manifestation. So we talked about manifestations in, in the governess, about manifestations of extremism even in the legal arena, uh, about uh, uh, the manifestations in, in changing the culture, which, uh, which uh, John Ospisito touched upon, because things that are supposed to be unacceptable in America, People cannot say them, should not. It is four letter words, so to speak, uh, uh, are now being said. As long as they are said about Muslims, they become part of the vocabulary. They, they, they are, it's exactly like you are bringing up your child and you put him uh, with a bunch of people who say very ugly words, but those words are not ugly if they are said against this. You are not aware that you are ruining the character of your child and to yourself, and I think this is happening a lot uh, in America now, and uh, we will come to, 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 to ask uh, how to deal with it, uh, but because it is a change in the, typo the, the, the moral typography of the country, uh, which is quite serious and far-reaching. Um, I, I wanted to, to ask, uh, John Aspicito about how he relates this to religious extremism. Well, I think that, um, from my point of view, I think that there are political extremists who are simply political extremists for political reasons. But there are many who have other agendas. Uh, whether they are uh, Zionist, whether they are Muslim, whether they are Christian. But I think the two observations that I've been trying to make lately when it comes to the relationship of religion to extremism, um, and th this is, I think, easy to understand, but it's not easy to understand. First of all, most religious traditions as they developed, certainly monotheistic traditions, and, and definitely Christianity and Islam, have had a tendency towards exclusivism. Islam has been less exclusivist than Christianity. It made a place for Jews, it made a place for Christians, etc. But there's always been a kind of struggle with, if, if I have the final and full, fullness of revelation, if it's the final covenant, then, and the fine, if you will, the fullness of truth, then how does that relate to the other and the truth of the other? You know? And to what extent do I need to deal with that? And for example, um, I remember speaking in Saudi Arabia. I was the first non-Muslim uh, to speak at Imam Saud University. It took them about six months to set it up. And then just before I went in, they wanted to vet me three more times to make sure because they were worried how the students would react. And after it, it's very interesting. The audience reacted very positively and they said, 
well, we really need more people like you who understand Islam, really understand it from within. And I said, well, actually, there's a whole new generation, this was a while ago, that are coming along that include that. I said, but how many of you in this audience have studied Christianity and Judaism very closely? And I raised my hand, and very few had. And, and I said, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you an answer to it, too. I said, what most of you are going to tell me is you don't need to, because you can know everything you want to know about Judaism and Christianity, you can find in the Quran. And I said, you know, even if you believe that, the whole point is if you want to understand what a Christian and a Jew believe, mm -hmm. then you have to understand what they believe, right. not what you think they do. All right, so first thing, point I want to make is that when you're dealing with extremism, the road to extremism is, in fact, paved by exclusivist theologies. It's then a very slippery slope to go from an exclusivist theology, which, you know, which says, if I'm right, then how can you be wrong? If I'm, you know, if I'm with God, then you know, how do I fit you in, et cetera, you know? Um, it's a slippery slope to go from that to a militant form. It's a very slippery slope, and particularly if in your exclusivist theology you subscribe to what I call, and some of you have heard this before, the Hyatt Regency approach, which doesn't work for this Hyatt Regency, unfortunately. Most Hyatt, Hyatt, Hyatt Regencies have glass elevators, so you know, you know you're going up by everybody else going down. Well, some of my Christian and Muslim friends, that's their theology. You know, the, the only way they know they're going up is that other people are going down. Now, first is that it's got to be people of other faith, but then even people within their own faith who disagree with them. When you have that mentality, you know, then it's very easy for the bin Ladens of the world to move from that mentality, that framework, you know, framing of the world, to then the militant extremists. And you see that operating within, for example, uh, the Christian right. You have the mainstream Christian right. I have no problem with mainstream evangelicals, mainstream Baptists, mainstream Catholics. But it's when you get to the militant right that you then see in the words of a Robertson, you know, and of others, as you find with some, some Muslim speakers and some Jewish speakers, they give you the impression that, yes, God is a God of compassion, but this, what they never tell you is, the dirty little secret is he's only a God of compassion for me, right. see, not for you, you know. Mm -hmm. And so from, from their, their approach, everybody else is going to go to hell. If you have that mentality, it's then easy to move to that militant form, which then supports the kind of extremism, extremism that we see blatant in the, in the words of some religious leaders, okay, but also that we see in political commentators, both here and in the Arab Muslim world, that is informed by a kind of religious, ideological worldview. Sometimes they state that it's informed by it, and other times they don't. And it's the ones that don't that are the more deceptive. Can I, can I give a, 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 Please, an well, example I, of that? I, I, I want to follow up on that because it, it really leads perfectly into a kind of unbelievably irresponsible call and response between uh, extremists in the United States, political, extreme political commentators in the United States, and pe a couple of people very prominent in the Middle East uh, who are both religious and political commentators at the same time in the past few weeks over the subject of Iraq. In the United States, you've got a group of neoconservatives uh, who are extremely right-wing, newspaper columnists, notably William Sapphire of the New York Times and Charles Krautimer of the Washington Post, and they're both syndicated all over, uh, making the most outrageously irresponsible statements about the forthcoming uh, scheduled elections in Iraq, blaming the Sunni, Iraqi Sunni community entirely, casting the war in Iraq as a war between the United States and the Kurds of Iraq and the Shia of Iraq all together against the Sunnis of Iraq, saying of the Sunnis of Iraq that they need to be suppressed violently by the other three groups, and if they, if they cannot or do not or somehow are not able to participate in this election, which is to elect a body that will write the constitution for Iraq, not just a parliament. It's a, it's a, a constitutional body that if, if somehow they're for one reason or another not included, well, too bad, and it's okay because this is really a war against them, right? Unbelievably irresponsible, almost ver really calling essentially for a civil war in Iraq, and almost embracing the notion that partition of that country might be a desirable goal, because the logical outcome of this kind of appalling 
caterwauling is, is that. On the other side of this divide, you've got uh, Sheikh Youssef Karadawi on Al Jazeera and other in his show, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Sharia wal Hayat, or whatever it is, or the other way around, uh, saying several times, not just once, but several times, that resistance, you know, undefined, just generally, resistance to the occupation in Iraq is an individual duty, right? Now, here you've got, I think, an extraordinary situation. I mean, the, the, the guy is not a freelance operator. He sits there under the patronage of the royal family of Qatar. And you've got him and Al Jazeera sitting in the middle of Doha. And 15 miles behind, CENTCOM. Right, this gigantic U.S. military base out of which the invasion and occupation of Iraq is run. Right? So you've got this situation where, uh, in a sense, there's a facilitation of the entry into Iraq and then turning around and saying, okay, now the Americans are there, you guys go ahead and it's your duty to kill them. I mean, it, it's, it's almost un unspeakably irresponsible to say find in both of these positions an utter disregard for the fundamental interests of the Iraqi people who need to have calm, who need to have their country restored to them, who need to rebuild their society and not uh, have uh, a, you know, a civil war egged on by Sharon uh, supporting American columnists and, and not have you know, an, an anarchic situation of generalized violence blessed by uh, uh, religious and political uh, advice givers on television. I I think it's just, it's, it really leaves one tasting the immediate fruit of irresponsible political extremism from two different directions, colliding head-on like a couple of trains on an Indian railroad. You know, but. Well, I, the, the side have an addition to, to that. Okay, in, in that case, I, I'd like to, to go to the final question before we receive your questions. I think volunteers are going around with cards, uh, so please uh, write your questions and uh, bring them here so that I select the ones I like uh, and pass to the panels. Now, I, we, I'd like to, without even consulting with the staff of PAC yet, is questions that are not answered, we'll try to answer them on our website. Uh, uh, impactusa.com. Am I correct, people? Dot org. Dot org. Sorry, I am a computer whiz. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, the, 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 if you ask a question that is not answered, uh, I, I think we'll do the best we can. And it is also an opportunity to force you to open our page and, uh, and, and find the answer there. Uh, we were, I was wondering. And I, I'll ask uh, Jack, then Shireen, uh, is there an antidote? Is there, is there a, a medicine that we can give to the country to, to, to deal with that? Whether in terms of actual activism or ideas. Uh, let's start by Jack, then Shireen. Let me talk <clears throat> about religious extremism and antidotes uh, to religious extremism. No, we'll come to political. Mm -hmm. Religious... And we, then go on to political. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the religious uh, form comes about by an identification of an individual with God. The arrogation of yeah. divine authority, divine greatness uh, to a particular individual. And uh, how is that exposed and counteracted? I believe by exposure, because as John Esposito uh, was pointing out a moment ago, it may begin by uh, the person claiming divine authority for what are in fact his private views, uh, despising uh, and organizing against members of some other religion, but it soon proceeds to members of his own religion who don't conform with his own views, and that circle gets smaller and smaller. What does this tell us? It tells us that the, the more you expand the group, the more members of your own community you bring into the conversation, the sooner that uh, false identification by one individual with God uh, is 
uh, is brought down, it begins to seem extreme, it begins to seem ridiculous, it begins to seem unacceptable and insulting to the other members uh, of the uh, religious community. Something analogous uh, takes place in political extremism when an individual leader identifies himself with the country such that if you criticize him, you're criticizing the country. This is, this is the, the, the syndrome that we saw underway when to criticize anything done by the Bush administration in connection uh, with the quote unquote war on terrorism or the invasion of Iraq was to expose yourself to the charge of disloyalty of lack of patriotism, of almost uh, treason. Uh, but the more uh, the conversation on that point is broadened, the more people begin talking about what they mean by patriotism, what they mean by Americanism, what they respect as a truly American leader, the more difficult it be becomes to sustain that identification of a particular policy and a particular uh, person with the country uh, itself. So I might put it all in one uh, quick sentence and say, the more, the merrier, the fewer, the sadder. Uh, I'd like to focus, can you I'd like to focus um, more narrowly on what the Muslim community and Americans at large um, can do in the face of the, uh, the threat to civil rights that's ongoing. Um, and I specifically want to make a point of one thing that I believe is a very great danger uh, to the Muslim community, and that is being ourselves so chilled by the prevailing political climate that um, we don't speak out and we don't act as strongly as we otherwise would. And I'd like to give you one quick example of this. Uh, a few months ago, uh, I called the editor of an ethnic newspaper in the Muslim community. Um, which you know, I'm, I'm not going to name. Uh, and I asked whether they had an interest in columns written on civil rights um, from, you know, from the perspective of someone working in the field. And the immediate response of the editor was, only if they're conciliatory. Hmm. He didn't miss a beat in responding. And I, I was quite appalled, actually. And you know, I asked, what did he mean? And he said, well, we don't want to talk about all the negative things that have been going on. We don't want to be targeted. And I was shocked. I've heard a lot of you know, people in the community who are afraid to speak out and afraid to act. But it still shocked me that a newspaper and that journalists whose responsibility is to the community to publicize abuses of civil rights was so alarmed at being targeted that he didn't want these things written. Um, and that I, I, you know, part of me understands, and you know, I, I, I'm very well aware of all the targeting that has happened, but I really felt like, you know, at some point, that that just cannot be the response. That that just isn't good enough. And I think we, particularly those of us who are Americans and who are citizens, but even those of us who are not, um, must really be at the forefront of protesting civil rights violations um, and not being just incrementally, you know, getting used to everything that's happening um, so that the next thing doesn't seem as bad because, you know, we've already lost so much. Um, and I'll just make one more point then conclude. Um, during Japanese internment, some of us may be surprised to learn that the Japanese American Citizens League, which was the main civil rights organization of the Japanese American community, actually handed over lists of Japanese Americans to the federal government in order to assist them in their internment com campaign. That's shocking. And you know, I should say that the JACL right now, and this today, has been a very great supporter of civil liberties um, involving post-9-11 abuses. But at that time, they were that afraid. Even the ACLU nationally did not speak out. Only the Northern California chapter protested internment and took up legal action. So that's the risk, and that's the danger. And I think it's just important for everyone not to let the climate of intimidation chill our own political and religious expression. I mean. Uh, two points I'd, I'd like to, to interject before we, we proceed. Uh, on, the, on the issue of intimidation and the fear, uh, I think, uh, uh, thanks God with having this panel, this convention, with having this audience, it's very clear that uh, at least uh, this organization, together with other organizations, uh, are determined not to, not to, to hide uh, 
uh, we, we are not going to allow anybody, anybody to, to rob us off our, our rights as citizens and our sacred duty of dissent. Uh, we, we will say no when we have to say no, and we, we, when we say it loudly, and we'll say yes when we have to say yes, and we'll say it softly. Uh, uh, because the problem is to dare to say no. Yes is an easy word. No is the one with consequences, and we, we are pledging to you that uh, in impact we, we will say it loudly, no matter what the consequences are. The second point that I want to clarify very, very fast, because we talked about religion uh, and exclusive, ex exclusivism. Where is the accent of Salam here? Uh, 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 just very fast, I think the, the problem is too deeply rooted in the concept of God Almighty himself in the minds of Muslims, Christians, and Jews alike. Uh, do we create God or did God create us? I, I leave this question with you because if we agree that we don't make God so we cannot monopolize him, we cannot own him, he cannot be ours. If we agree that God created us, it is clear that he wanted us to take different ways. Uh, otherwise, we'll question his ability and capability which is uh, negate the very basic idea of faith. So uh, people of religion have to address the fundamentals to become fundamentalists. No, no not, that, not their way. But to go to the very basic thing, uh, if I believe in God, then uh, certain things, amongst them is to exclude the other, is incompatible. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that. And we proceed, I ask, uh, John and Hussein, if you want to add anything on the same, please. Just add one point. I think something that we forget in the current environment, uh, the post-9-11 environment, the war on terrorism, but also the kind of extremism we've been talking about among political and religious commentators, is that the litmus test for whether or not you're a significant Muslim group is whether or not you're criticized publicly or attacked. Mm. The simple reality of it is, I cannot think of one major effective Muslim organization that has not been criticized or attacked. Even the one or two who post 9-11, many said, well, it's a kind of major organization, but they're not having a problem. In fact, people in Washington are inviting them down because they don't get involved in politics. They come on the radar screen. And the same thing is true for individuals. You know, uh, and that, that shows the sign of the extremist side. But, but part of what you have to realize then is that, you know, therefore, in a, in a funny kind of way, whether you're an individual or a group, I'd almost say in the current climate, if nobody's talking about you, if nobody's ever referring to you, then it means they don't consider you a threat. They either don't hear you or they, or they don't consider you a threat. And that's an issue. And then the second point I, I want to uh, mention, because I've mentioned this in a lot of, uh, to a lot of Muslim groups that I've spoken to, if you don't fight for your rights, who do you expect to do it? Yeah. That's a reality. <laughs> and it's not enough to say to somebody else, well, you should do it because you're not a Muslim or you're not. A, I mean, it's kind of an interesting sort of thing. It's got, I always want to say, oh, and you're going to come and visit me? when I'm in jail or what? I mean, you know, what's the logic here? I mean, the thing that ethnic and religious groups have learned in the past, that Italian Americans learned, and I have to correct my old friend Maher on this one, there is no mafia. It's an Irish creation. Uh, <laughs> but the one thing that we have learned, and we learned over the years, is that if you don't get organized, American Jews learned it, every group, it starts from you, then you get others who will join with you. But if others after a while see that you're not moving, or as I like to put it to my friends both overseas and here, if you can wake up a week from now and say this almost every week of your life, if your life hasn't changed in any way every week of your life if you're not doing more, then all you are is this sort of typical couch potato. You like to talk about the problem, but you never get off your tail and do anything about it. And post 9-11, it's pretty sad because while I see many Muslims mobilizing, I see an awful lot of others 
who simply are prospering in their jobs, going on their vacations, doing even you know, more than you know, of that. And I wonder, other than talking about the problem, what are they doing? Or the others who are worried about photo ops with the president. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I mean, very briefly, I, I just think there is no panacea. Um, yeah. It's political extremism is a uh, universal uh, human phenomenon. It's always present, and it's it's always a danger. And there is no political tendency, movement orientation that is free of the extremist uh, pull. As, as I said last year when I was here, I'm talking about. Um, you know, I consider myself a, a very committed secularist, but I look at the, uh, you know, the, the French position on the hijab and I see secular extremism here and the limiting of choices in an irrational uh, way and I shake my head and it just reminds me that there is no panacea. The only thing I think uh, uh, that I can say that would be helpful briefly is, is that we all need to recognize that th th there is no such thing you know, as a, as a homogenous society uh, in this world. We, we live in a heterogeneous world of heterogeneous societies in which there are heterogeneous neighborhoods that consist of heterogeneous families, okay? And, you know, if you expect uh, everyone, uh, you know, if, if you're not ready to embrace that fundamental heterogeneity of human existence, of human society, uh, your first step on the road to extremism has been taken. The second thing uh, is that uh, no matter what orientation, um, intellectual, political, religious, you come from, uh, you really have to adhere, I think, to universal standards. I mean, I think, uh, in other words, uh, the basic uh, rights and privileges that you would accord to anyone have to be given to, to everyone, um, you know, except for criminals, I suppose, convicted criminals, but, but everyone uh, outside of that, uh, you know, regardless of, uh, regardless of the way they uh, choose to live their lives within the law. And the law, as I say, should not, should be about maximizing choices and not minimizing them. So, uh, a point of, uh, of order, the volunteers are supposed to collect the questions and bring them here. It seems that they are keeping the questions for well, Maybe themselves. there are no questions. If, if, you, <laughs> if you want to answer them, I'd be glad to. Thank you very much. Then all of a sudden, the lady gives me 100 questions. OK, 200 questions. <laughs> all right. I guess there are questions. Yeah, there are plenty of questions. I, I, I'll, I'll volunteer to answer some of those myself. <laughs> the ones that are easy. Uh, do you see some forms of extremism within the Muslim community? Absolutely, yes, to a dangerous limit and to a dangerous degree. There is, uh, there is no way that we progress without facing our own, our own uh, problems. And like uh, uh, John Esposito said, if you don't defend your rights, and nobody else will defend them. If you don't clean your home, nobody else will clean it for you either. Uh, so yes, we have extremist ideas, and we have the whole uh, campaign uh, against terrorism and extremism, the grassroots campaign, that I hope that you pick up the booklets and you support, uh, designed uh, to deal uh, with that. Our, our community is doing better. We're moving past, before, there was a, a sentiment that solidarity trumped everything else. And I think we're getting beyond that and, and about time. Because solidarity doesn't trump everything else. It cannot. Yeah. Uh, I have an interesting question also here. I am an American Muslim born in Pennsylvania. So, yeah, some of them are. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Pennsylvania. We are honored to have you here. Uh, I wear hijab and I have no accent. Many Americans think that I am a nun or an Amish. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we stand up for moderate Islam without appearing to be proselytizing and calling to Islam? Uh, my appearance plus my good behavior is not enough. Uh, who would like, uh, John Esposito, you are the Muslim authority on the panel now. Please, please deal with that. 
Um, if, if you could just quickly read that again, I was just uh, asking something. It is the, 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 yeah. the sister is uh, a Muslim. Uh, Where's the hijab? Is confused with Where's the hands. hijab? Speaks without an accent. She's well behaving, and uh, from her writing, she's very likable. And uh, she says, "Is this a marriage proposal?" Or what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we take the question then to Hussein. No, 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 and, and the people think that she is either a nun or an Amish. Amish. How? You see Amish close to Abish, so you should have. Uh, so she, she, she's wondering uh, what else can she do? She doesn't want to, to be a preacher, but she wants to be identified as Muslims, uh, as a Muslim, uh, without preaching, and she feels that what she is doing is not enough. Well, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that I've, I've always said um, is that there are two, two ways to, for people to come to know another faith and to appreciate it. Uh, one is the so-called dialogue. You know, people get together in a formal setting and they talk about their faith. That's okay. And you can be involved in discussion groups, etc. But I think the better way for Americans to discover Islam is when they discover Islam in their neighborhoods, uh, where they work, at uh, PTA meetings, etc. That is, when you come to engage somebody, um, if you will, on neutral territory, and you come to know, like them, you see you share things in common, th at a certain point, the religious dimension can come out. One doesn't need to hide that. But when it then does come out, people are much more open to engaging. When you start the intellectual side, and, and particularly post 9 11, uh, the danger is that immediately becomes a Q&A. And Q&As in today's context can be very offensive. Let me give you two examples. I just finished doing a CNN interview. Now, the media has a problem with a learning curve. I, I now say this publicly. I have the best profession in the world because for 30 years or 40 years, I get paid to say the same thing, only frame it differently. Whether it's talking to government officials, I mean, it's the same basic questions. Is Islam a particularly violent religion? Uh, you know, and you think about, it, are there moderate Muslims? Are there, you know, with other faiths, at a certain point, you kind of answer it and you move on, or you distinguish between, you know, diversity within it. Well, the CNN interview was the same old questions. You know, uh, uh, why are Muslims extremists? What, we, what can we do about their religious leaders? You know, these kinds of things. And, and it, on the other hand, I was talking to a professional, very well educated, and he started to talk about Muslims, and he said, oh, no, no, I'm talking about the extremists. I want to distinguish you from the mainstream. Now, watch what he said next. And it seems to me that what the mainstream Muslim world needs is uh, religious leaders to reinterpret the Quran so they don't believe that they have to kill all of us. So what I'm trying to say is, post 9-11, no matter what is almost being said, there are problems. But when people engage you in a neighborhood, and many of you experienced that after 9-11, the people that you knew, knew you. They liked you and respected you. So, you know, that's who you were. And in light of that, they, they would think if they also come to know that you, you're a person of, of, of religious faith, that, gee, your religious faith must be the support for some of that. I think that's the most important, important way to go about it. Mm -hmm. uh, to, yes, I, would, I would like to add <clears throat> something to that last uh, questioner. Uh, I think she's doing very well, uh, whoever you are. I think you're doing just fine. Don't change anything. But don't expect that it's up to you. God will take care of Islam. The, the matter is not in, in the hands of any one of us. And what you have, what, what you're doing strikes me as just, just perfect. I wouldn't change a thing. Okay. Uh, see? You don't want to add anything? Okay. I, uh, I have been told by the dictators out there uh, that uh, we have uh, five more minutes. Uh, so probably you should start the fight against dictatorship and don't listen. No. Uh, here, a, here is a question, I think, to all the panel. Uh, can we distinguish state terrorism between brackets, war, bombing, military means, etc., from political and religious extremism? Uh, reference Professor Iqbal Ahmed's yeah. terrorism, uh, etc. 
So uh, I would like to take a shot. Uh, okay. Take a short shot because yeah, we need a, a shot, shot from every uh, every member of the panel. Kbal Ahmed uh, is one of the uh, forgotten heroes of the 20th century, I think, and uh, it's just scandalous how little of his work is available in print. It's it's really unfortunate. But I mean, I think the crucial thing here, uh, the answer to the question is no. You you can't distinguish, and I don't think it's it's appropriate to distinguish uh, state terrorism or, or terrorism engaged in by states from uh, terrorism engaged in by non-state actors. That is an arbitrary distinction simply designed to give people who wear the uniform uh, of uh, member states of the United Nations uh, some sort of uh, immunity or special dispensation to murder people uh, without being held to the same standard. And that's absolutely unacceptable. Uh, so it, do it really doesn't matter. And, and I think, you know, obviously a lot of the conversation uh, about terrorism in the United States post 9-11, which has its roots in uh, a, a kind of uh, lexicon that was crafted mainly by Israelis and supporters of Israel during the mid-1980s uh, when uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was the ambassador of Israel to the United States and the United Nations and, and edited a book called Terrorism, colon, How the West Can Win. Okay, now you want a stacked deck. It's right there in, in the title, right? Uh, and, and so it's the West versus terrorism. In that case, it was terrorism as a cat's paw of the Soviet Union. But the language survived this kind of uh, post-Cold War and, and post-9-11 uh, circumstance where um, in the minds of, or it, let's say built into a lot of American discourse, uh, states simply aren't capable of conducting terrorism. Terrorism is defined strictly as being conducted by non-state actors. And that is completely unacceptable morally. It's unacceptable intellectually. It leads to political dead ends. And so I really think the answer is no, and not only no, no way. And we shouldn't acquiesce to it. Okay, now we have less than one minute. Uh, John, do you and want the very, to and the very say? People, the very people who say, for example, that uh, states, you, you shouldn't talk about state terrorism, that, that the state is exempted from that, they're the very people who, when it's been convenient, if you take a look, refer to Syria as a terrorist state, sure. or refer to Iran as a terrorist state, or refer to, now, it, it's fine. I, I think one ought to refer to states when they're terrorists, but they would say, no, you don't do that, particularly when it comes to their allies. But then when it's somebody they don't like, then it becomes Iraq is a terrorist state. So I think that we need to move beyond that. And it's only if we do that we'll be able to deal with the political realities that exist. Right. Okay. It's back to that imperative of a single standard for everybody. Yeah. That, that's so important. <laughs> uh, a moderate Muslim? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> in the interest of time, I will just defer to my esteemed colleagues. Okay, we have one esteemed colleague left. So. <laughs> Both state-sponsored terrorism and st terrorism under other than state sponsorship are terrorism, but it is essential to distinguish between the two. Otherwise, when uh, a non-state actor produces an act of terrorism, the retaliation may come against a state. That's what we're witnessing uh, in the case of the invasion of uh, Iraq. A commits an act, the response is delivered to B. This, I think, uh, comes from just uh, a catastrophic failure to make that distinction. It isn't that both are not terrorism, but we must recognize from what direction the terrorism comes. Thank you very much. In, uh, in, uh, in conclusion, I will, I will uh, uh, ask you to read the counterterrorism paper that impact produced it is it is a very good document talking about definitions and about state ter uh, uh, terrorism and group terrorism as well i think you agreed with me that this is a wonderful panel uh, very 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 capable people that we 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 really bow to their integrity and expertise thank you very much assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Coming up, the future of China and the Communist Party. After that, the 2004 election and its...